All right, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Andy, and this is my little introduction to Conescence. I kept calling it Conescence. I probably will weave between the pronunciations, but uh, I'll do my best. I think it's Conescence. Um, Conescence, oh my God. Um, all right, starting off a little bit about me. I'm a tech and people lead at Flick. Um, so pretty much the same role that we're hiring for. So if you have any questions about that, I'm more than happy to answer. I've been at Flick for six years. Um, and it's a lovely time, so I can recommend. Um, tech is definitely cool, but I, I do find myself more drawn to the, oh, I missed about, you know, um, uh, but I am much more drawn to more people topics, so like sustainable teams, feedback, communication, mental health, all that stuff. So if you want to talk about that, I'm more than uh, willing. Um, photography is sort of my, my free time thing, I guess. Had a little exhibition at uh, Black Coffee in Newtown earlier this year. Got some just like a smattering of blog posts related to that that uh, collection of things if you care. And I did this. If that doesn't make you want to be a tech and people lead, I don't know what uh, what will. Uh, cool. So this is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, this is what you are in for. Um, for instance, what is it? How do you measure it? Um, how do you categorize it? What are all these specific things that it is? The types of conescence, I guess. Uh, and, and now that you know all that, what can you do? Um, and sort of what are its limitations? What are the caveats associated with Conescence? Um, sort of all the general resources that I've been using um, that are worth sharing. There are some talks that are, that are really great um, that will be worth checking out. But anyway, Conescence. The reason you say Conescence and not Conescence. Um, nascence means coming to ex into existence for the first time. The development of something new. Uh, co is together. These are two things that are kind of uh, sort of hanging out. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a thing that's all about coupling. So code is coupled. If a change to one requires a change to the other, um, Conescence is designed to kind of measure how much change is going to be required. Um, and the thing that I like, sort of the reason that I quite like it is that coupling can be like quite a general concept. Um, but Conescence gives you that specific language for discussing and understanding um, and kind of refactoring your code, I guess. So particularly when you're working with more junior developers, you know, if you're a senior developer, you might just get the vibe that something's wrong, um, but it can be a little bit difficult to really explain the vibe. Um, also, fun fact about Conescence is that um, when they came up with it, they were like, if we just call this coupling, no one's going to pay attention to it because everyone thinks they know what <laughs> coupling is. So we're going to call it something else. Um, so it's kind of fun. Anyway. Uh, we measure conescence on three dimensions, strength. Uh, so we'll be going through the individual kind of types of conescence, each of those roughly associated with a strength. A strength is like how difficult it is to find it, how difficult it is to refactor it. Um, degree, how, how uh, spread out is this thing? Is, is one thing involved, are two things involved, or a thousand things involved? The more, the more things that are involved, the more it's going to be uh, annoying to, to fix and, and locality. So how close are these things together? Is it all within a single class? Is it within your entire application? Um, or is it, I guess, within a single application? Is it within communicating applications? Is there an external party involved? You know, the further away it is, the more annoying it's going to be to, to fix this thing if you want to fix it. Um, so yeah, the general rule is just improving anything on any of these axes will make, uh, make it better. Cool. So we got static and we got dynamic. Static. In general, something that like a compiler could find. Um, oddly, in Ruby, not always the compiler. <laughs> you don't got a compiler, so. Um, but in general, easier to find by studying the code by your eye, um, or some kind of static code analysis. Um, dynamic conescence. Uh, sometimes you can only find it by running it, and sometimes, uh, in the worst case, you find it by running it at scale. Um, so yeah, generally because dynamic is uh, harder to find, identify. Sometimes fix, it's uh, in general stronger, I guess. Um, so these are the things. We're just going to be going down this list. Um, I'm going to skip one, though, because I kind of want to talk about it uh, with you all. Uh, cool. Static. Um, cool. So kind of sense of name. This is sort of the uh, bottom of the barrel, the cream of the crop. I don't know. It depends how you look at it. Um, this is when things reference each other by name. So. It's pretty hard to write code without referencing something else by name. I don't know if I've ever written code without referencing something by name. So this is sort of the safest. Um, 
there's a bunch of sort of versions um, of refactoring that you would do that would bring things closer to this. Um, so it kind of sits as it's just there, you know, not much else to say. So anytime you're referencing something by class name, method name, you're using keyword parameters, uh, that is kind of since by uh, of name. Skipping past type, because that's the one I want to talk about later. Um, but we're going into meaning. So connections of meaning. Uh, this is when more than one entity kind of needs to agree on what a value means, um, which very much confused me when I got to connaissance of value. I got those confused all the time. Um, but this is when you have like uh, sort of static data of some kind that has a very specific meaning. So I've kind of just got uh, a relatively basic example here, but we've got some payment taking method. But you're in UAT, you want to test. You don't want to take a payment. Um, you want to just pass in this test credit card number and it's just going to skip all that payment stuff and it'll just uh, return true. Um, that's well and good. This is, of course, a very local example. But um, sort of the catch with conascence of meaning is that if you want to give a value a specific meaning, you need to make sure that that meaning is consistent across your whole system. So if your payment taker is actually going to, you know, it's going to skip payment over here, but it's not going to over here, you're going to get some unexpected behavior. So yeah, that's sort of an aspect of conascence of meaning, I guess. Ooh, conascence of position. Um, so this is when the order of values matter. So you've got uh, things getting passed to a method without a keyword involved, or you're returning an array of data, um, that sort of thing. I'll just um, jump to the example because it's probably a bit better. And I could not be bothered fixing that code. So the, I'm sorry. Um, so let's imagine you've got some system where you log in, and then you've got this uh, beautiful, little bit confusing method that returns information about that logged in user. Um, I feel like this is a good example because it's about as confusing as it probably should be. You can kind of guess that uh, this is first name and this is last name. No clue what that third value means. Um, and also not entirely apparent what that fourth value means. Um, but we do have this uh, is, is admin kind of checking method um, that takes in your user details. Um, so it's kind of coupled with this method now. And if you happen to be, you know, it checks this last element here. And if it's, uh, if it's truthy, then congrats, you're an admin. Or sleep, sneaking in a little connaissance of uh, meaning as well. If your first name is admin, congrats, you're also an admin. It's in the name. Um, so yeah, this, this is sort of an example of connaissance of position. And I think it's also a pretty good example of why it can be quite confusing. You're kind of taking, an op you're, you're taking away the opportunity to give these values any meaning. <laughs> um, and if you've, you know, wanted to wiggle these values around, um, you're getting less sort of in tooling support for finding out that you've made a big mistake. Um, yeah. I feel like there's something else I had to say about that, but it's okay. Um, cool, connaissance of algorithm. So this is when more than one thing kind of has to agree on a particular algorithm for them to work successfully. Um, you know, the, the go-to example is encryption. If you encrypt something you, uh, with a certain algorithm, you've got to decrypt it with the same algorithm, otherwise you're just gonna get some nonsense. Um, but the other kind of maybe more applicable to day-to-day -to -day life thing is around validation. Um, I've picked potentially a too simplistic example, but um, let's say that we love to validate emails um, and we have, you know, in our system, we've got signups. Um, we love to have signups and then we love to turn them into accounts. Um, but somewhere in between, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a risk in this example because we've got a very basic um, validation when we're signing up, but we've got a very strict or like a much more strict to be honest, I don't know what this regex does. I just copy pasted it, but it looked complicated and that's, that's the main thing. <laughs> does it not work? No, 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 I was gonna, I was gonna laugh, but I did Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, you can, like, this is very simplistic, but you can kind of imagine anything that's kind of validating your data somewhere in some way or expecting data to be in a very certain format that if, you're moving that through your system and certain parts are disagreeing on the way that that format should be, that you're eventually gonna run into problems. This can kind of be a scale thing as well. You can have most users entering a perfectly normal, happy uh, email and then the occasional chaotic one. Um, particularly tricky with things like this is that 
it can be like a data fix and um we've had the occasional version of that and you're looking at like a customer's email and you're like what did they mean this to be and that's just like not a good situation to be in so anyway don't do that um oh yeah i'll just throw in a couple of other good examples of connaissance of algorithm i reckon ssh is pretty neat because when you're using ssh at uh Use, with the site, client and the server, it negotiates which algorithm is the best to use based on all of those available. So it's kind of an interesting way to do connaissance of algorithm and sort of just make sure that you're speaking the same language in kind of a dynamic at runtime way. Uh, similarly, JWTs will store the algorithm that they use to generate the checksum, which means that you know you can change that over time and things know what to use to validate them. Cool. All right. Forgot about that. We're zipping back to type. Um, cool. So this one, I guess, is the one that I would think about the most because I'm always changing those types, you know? Um, so this is when multiple components must agree on the type of an entity. Um, statically type language is, of course, much stricter. Um, Ruby a little bit more dynamic. But yeah, no matter what, it sort of applies. Um, if something depends on a certain type, um, you're going to have issues if things are not getting the type that they expect or if that type changes over time. Um, so boring example, but if you have a method and it's supposed to be passed an array and you pass it a string, it might work, but um, it may not do what you're expecting it to do. Um, and I guess no matter what, when you're crossing over, I, I use the term service because we talk about services in our like distributed Flick system, and I, I know that that's probably confusing with our Ruby services, but I'm sorry, but crossing application boundaries um, because APIs um, so I've invented a little example, which I thought would be interesting to get some ideas from the room about different approaches. I guess I've got a couple of my own ideas, but yeah. So we've got our magical network application, and it's got some beautiful APIs, and all these services, they want to use these APIs. So we've created our network client. Um, it is designed to talk to the network application, um, and we have some kind of dashboard application that's using the client to talk to the network application. And of course, um, you may have guessed that there's kind of connaissance of type at play in both of these things. And at some point, these two things are probably going to want to change. Um, so my question to the room, what do you do to make these safer? Well, yeah. A <laughs> um, couple of things that I have thought of, or like I guess I've seen slash thought of. Um, one would be you can just be very specific about what these APIs look like and what it gets mapped to. Um, that, of course, gives you something a lot more concrete to make your mocks against. So assuming that these are all stored or shared in some way between the network client and the network application, um, then that's great. You can you can mock based on these very specific objects. Um, some kind of in-between option that I've used to some success is uh, storing fixtures inside the client itself. Um, so rather than the dashboard application inventing fixtures for itself, it relies on the fixtures inside the client. And that means that if you wanna make some kind of fundamental or even minor change to the API, you can regenerate some fixtures, put them into the gem. Um, and then when you bump that gem, all the new fixtures kind of filter through and you then find out that stuff is breaking at the um, kind of at the test level rather than at the runtime level, which is nice. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Type annotations, yeah. Yeah, API versioning is definitely probably the go-to overall to avoid. Uh, no. Nice. So I should have mentioned, you can judge how I feel right now based on this, the shininess of my forehead. <sighs> um, all right, we're on to dynamic. Uh, connaissance of execution. So this is when the order of execution matters. Um, uh, very straightforward because it's very localized. But we are trying to send an email. And good news, we set the subject after we sent the email. Um, so this is kind of an example of connaissance of execution. Um, you can change, you know, you can probably set the subject before you set the to field or the from or whatever, doesn't matter. But if you've sent the email, 
it doesn't matter what you do because it's too late. You've sent the email. Um, it's not. It's not going to rewrite history. Um, so, I guess relatively straightforward to find when it's local. Um, but if you're me, you'll be finding these in production every now and then, um, and you'll have to be working them out, uh, working out how to fix these um, or improve sort of the architecture around them. So these are my uh, ambulance at the bottom of the cliff kind of tips, I guess. Um, very straightforward, is keep it as close as possible together. Um, if you want to manage state as well, don't manage it in more than one place. Um, queues with uh, retries will help you in some scenarios. If something's waiting for data to be set up, just let it, let it fail and it'll come back and it'll work eventually. It's definitely not ideal, but it can work for some scenarios. Um, Again, uh, I guess like defensive programming is another option. Just do, just, just do heaps of checks. Do I have the data? Um, and if you don't, um, and you have enough information when you are writing an error based around that, just give as much context as you can. And then rather than some misc nil reference floating around your system or some kind of state change didn't happen, um, you, can, you can actually kind of describe to the future developer what the heck has gone wrong um, and what they might need to do to fix it. Um, Auditing um, is not going to, you know, these are all things that are not necessarily going to stop the error from happening, but it's going to make it a million times easier to debug anyway. Cool. Coincidence of timing. Uh, timing of execution matters. So this is similar to execution, I guess, um, but it's more about sort of base conditions. So something like you're pulling data, you're You've pulled something out of the database, and before you've managed to make your change and save it back to the database, someone else has run under your feet and done some other thing. Um, I have grabbed a diagram from the internet. Uh, for so, first, the, these people have both read the value uh, read the value seventeen from the database. They've both updated it, but because one of them didn't under uh, there was no locking on the particular resource. Um, They've both changed it in the same way, and they've, they've eventually you've you've lost one. You've lost one. Uh, anyway, so what do you do? Locking locking will save you most of the time, thankfully. Um, transactions will prevent um, partial data from being read. Um, yeah, at least once I've had to search through the logs and find out that where the needle was thread. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's not something you have to do. But if you if you do, you'll be glad you got your logs. Um, I can't quite remember where this quote came from, but it was in one of the talks. Um, it may not affect you very much, but you were never safe. It'll get you eventually, especially if you plan to scale. Um, something's going to happen. Um, yeah, anyway. Conascence of value. So this is uh, when multiple values have to change together. Um, I've kind of put emphasis on the must. Um, I guess, like, because... When you're working in a distributed system, I think you'll often have stuff that probably should change together, but it's kind of okay as well. So I'm kind of covering both cases a little bit here, but I think strictly the rule is about things that must change together. Um, and the example that they generally use for this is you've got some kind of shape class. I don't think this is a square, but pretend it is. Um, and you want to make sure that that square is safe and it's always going to be a beautiful square. Um, but because you haven't, someone's changed one of the vertices, and now it's this other cursed object that is default in Google Slides. I didn't know how to move just one corner, um, but yeah. And then one of the other examples would be like, if you had to transfer money between two accounts that you know, you've know you got to subtract from one and make sure that the plus is in the other one. Um, I think in real life, banks would get around that by putting things into pending states. So they're kind of getting into that eventual consistency mode rather than immediate consistency. Um, so anyway, keeping values that must change together as close as possible to each other. If you have two applications that are like miles apart that absolutely have to change together, there's probably an indication that those need to be a little bit closer together. Um, at least if we're, they're within the same application, though, you get those sweet, sweet database transactions. They will save you. They've done all the, they've, they've crunched the numbers. They know how to make things happen or not happen all at once. Um, or just learn to live uh, with eventual consistency. I kept reading those, learn to love eventual consistency, but maybe it's the same. Um, queues are one way. So when we have 
Um, when we close an account at Flick, we raise an event, or, or actually when we open or close an account, we raise an event that a bunch of different services have their own message that says, hey, here's all the information you need, open this account. That can fail uh, much, re <laughs> not very often, but you know, it can fail, but it fails in isolation. We have a dead message queue, so we're able to pick up on anything that's gone wrong, and we're able to make sure that that eventually does succeed. So queues are kind of the default. They'll, they'll give you what you need. Um, these are sort of the situations when, it, when you're kind of like, you know, when you, when you don't have much time, make the, or, or just sort of like safe defaults, I guess, on top of everything else. Um, make the critical call first. So one example my workmate gave was uh, don't send the email before you've taken the payment. So in general, send the email last because uh, if something fails and it's keep constantly retrying, the uh, customer's going to get a lot of emails. Um, and make your system uh, services either item potent or just like item potent enough, you know, turn that create into a find or create. Um, it'll try again, it'll, it'll be okay. All right, and last from the types, coincidence of identity. I definitely find this one um, the most difficult to give examples for, but um, anyway. Uh, so this is when multiple entities must agree, or like must actually reference the specific, specific same reference of an object. Um, and I guess part of the reason that would make this so difficult to find is it's a very like runtime thing. If something's happened, it can be quite hard to work out which specific object was interacting with which specific object, even if you could say, you know, I know that this row from the database was pulled out, but I don't actually know what object it was um, involved. So um, yeah, and I, Something that came up in um, Jim Roach's talk was that uh, Rails does not use an identity map, which I guess we've, I mean, probably just used to at this point, but an identity map is something that would ensure that if you're pulling out customer number one from the database, you're always pulling out the exact same object customer number one. So if you're pulling that out in multiple places that they're all referencing the same object. Um, very basic example, but Rails doesn't do that. Um, so you can see that they've got very slightly different um, uh, object references there. So you'd change one, it wouldn't necessarily change the other. Um, probably not going to be a problem most of the time, but it might get you. Um, and then I was going to be so cool and I was going to pull two objects out of the database and compare them and they were going to not match, but then they did match and I was like, what the hell? So uh, they've actually kind of worked around this at least as far as equivalency um, checks with an active record by um, they compare the class, they compare the primary, and they check if it has a primary key and they're actually just comparing the primary key. So they've kind of got a way of working around it. Cool, so what can you do? There's some very like basic, basic rules essentially that are, um, I really liked this one, which was prefer stability. So you can have a really deep dependence on the string class. <laughs> That's okay, because the string class probably isn't gonna change that much. Um, and reduce degree, and I feel like that works quite well with the stability part. Like, if it's okay to depend on something if you're quite comfortable with it being stable. Um, but if you feel like it's something that's going to change a lot, then just don't have it in heaps of places, essentially. Um, and increase locality. That's pretty much across the board for all those dynamic connaissance um, cases are about just bringing things closer together, making them just that little bit easier to find. Um, if that email was being constructed over four different queues and something went wrong along the way, um, it would be a lot more difficult to debug than if it's in one file. Um, and what are the caveats? So I guess I'm not a big architect brain guy, so um, I find Kinesis very useful, but apparently it's uh, much more of a low level kind of architectural concept rather than a high level architectural concept. Um, but there are very much more evolved sort of concepts um, that sort of have built on coincidence. Um, they, they, I believe they refer to like architectural quantums, where the bigger the quantum or the smaller the quantum, the better. I don't know. Someone else can go and do that talk next year. Um, and what are some resources? So uh, this talk at the top is probably the best one, I would say. Um, he knows his stuff, Jim Roach. Um, much more engaging, I'd say. Um, Conascence.io is basically like the bare minimum of a website that covers Conascence. It's like a sentence per one and then like a little example. But if you want to remember what it is, then that's a place you can go. 
Um, uh, this book is where I found out about it, and it's got all the stuff that kind of builds on top of that. Uh, I, I don't know enough about it at this point to, to do anything uh, reasonably explaining about it, though. Um, and then some dude in Dunedin, Tommy Richards, apparently, some Python developer. Um, there's a talk of his as well, so that's kind of neat. Uh, anyway, that's the end. And I put at least five seconds of animation in this. So, I, <laughs> you know, when you've just been working on something for way too long and you just need to let off some steam. Cool. <laughs> Thanks all.